Welcome to Genesis Academy webinar session 45. For those who are not familiar with Progenesis Academy, this is an educational program specifically designed for IVF professionals with a special attention to embryologists. And our goal is to promote embryology and give embryologists the voice and credits they deserve. If you happen to miss any of our webinars, you can search it on our uh, websites, progenesis slash academy, or you can use YouTube channel. Our YouTube channel is Progenesis Academy. You can find all those webinars on the on YouTube. And today's topic is a comprehensive guideline on sperm quality assessment. We have a great panel of speakers introducing Dr. Esther Wiesen. She is a lab director at Mississippi Reproductive Medicine. And Dr. Anderson, and she is a lab director at Mainline Fertility. And Dr. Ivani, she is the senior embryologist at Reproductive Science Center, the Bay Area. Dr. Anderson, Tony Anderson, he's a lab director at Aspire Fertility Centers and EmbryoDirector.com. And Debbie Venier, she is the co-founder and director of trainer at the World Embryology Training Skills. Thank you so much, guys, for joining us. And our first speaker will be Debbie. Debbie, the floor is yours. Thank you so much. Um, so, Nabil, thank you so much for having us. I'm, I'm happy to be part of Progenesis webinars. You've, you've done a great job and a great service to all of us embryologists who need a, a, a place to, to see what's going on between our labs and, and share ideas. So. Um, Nabil has asked us to, to be a part of a comprehensive guide to sperm quality assessment. So um, I've been given five to seven minutes to zap you through um, some things that we find important for our sperm quality assessment. So I think most of us probably go by the WHO fifth edition guidelines. Um, some may still be with the fourth edition, but um, with the fifth edition, we First look obviously at volume um, with, the, with the parameter ranges being anywhere between one and a half and five mils being normal. Um, concentration, anything over 15 million would be considered normal. Our motility, if we're including both progressively modal and non-progressively modal, anything over 40% is in our normal range. And then for the morphology with the strict Kruger, I, 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 I don't know what just happened. Um, Anything over 4% is considered in the, the normal range. So um, other observations that we most of us have on our semen analysis forms are pH, that we like to see anything over 7.2, liquefaction, anything under 30 minutes, um, viscosity and agglutination, people have varying um, degrees of one to four for how much viscosity you're seeing and how much agglutination. Um, counting devices, I know this will vary from lab to lab. All of these counting devices are considered adequate. The hemocytometer and the Mackler, um, both are very easy to use and reusable, which makes them very cheap. But the downside to that is you have to clean it off and um, making sure it's perfectly clean between samples and, and the bit of a mess it could make. Sometimes people don't like. A lot of people prefer to use the disposable counting chambers because you do your count and you can toss the slide when you're done. Um, very easy. And then also the CASA machine, which is an automated system that does the, the counting and the motility for you, um, is becoming more and more popular as well. And the picture here I have shown is, is the whole large setup that they actually I've heard recently have just small handheld devices that you can literally travel with from satellite office to satellite office and do a semen analysis with a small handheld device, um, which sounds amazing. Um, motility, a couple of different ways to count your motility. I think the more common way is to simultaneously count with a counting um, device counting both your progressively modal, non-progressively modal, and non-modal all at the same time. Um, a little more detailed way to do it is to use the freezer where you first count your non-modal sperm 
And then you put your, your slide into the freezer, which freezes all of the modal and non-modal, then you count your total. So an example for that would be something like if you had a count of 40 non-modal on your slide and then you put it in the freezer, you bring it out in the same 10 squares or same area of where those 40 non-modal were, you count a total of 94, your um, post-freeze motility is now going to be 55 out of 95, which is 58%. I'm waiting for the next slide and I might get impatient. There we go. Um, so for morphology, um, two different ways to, to stain your slides, which for me, I love the pre-stained slides. I know they may not be the best, but they're quick and they're easy when they're pre-stained. You just drop your four to six microliters of sperm on there, put your cover slip on, and then you can do your morph um, a short time later. Um, also the diff quick, which is where you're dipping through um, the different stains and, and fixing your sperm on, takes a little bit longer, it's a little bit messier, um, but also gives you a very nice um, morphology read. So normal sperm versus abnormal sperm, things we're gonna be looking at in our abnormal sperm would be head defects being shaped vacuoles or an acrosome. Neck and mid piece de defects would be things like thick or a thin mid piece, an asymmetrical mid piece or neck, and then tail defects being short, bent, coiled. There is a ton of morphological abnormalities and, and not a ton of perfectly normal looking sperm out there. So um, in this particular picture right here, I probably wouldn't call any of these sperm normal. Waiting on the next slide, I think. There we go. Um, purification techniques. So lots of different labs do lots of different techniques and a lot of labs use multiple techniques on a case by case basis, depending on how the original count and motility um, look before a case. So typical would be um, some sort of gradient, whether it be a single gradient or a double gradient. Double gradients are usually 40 and 80% or a 45 and 90%. Don't really have a preference of one over the other. Um, single gradients are fine too. Some people will use a mini gradient, which is instead of using one mil of each gradient, they might use a half a mil of each gradient. And they would do that with sperm counts that are a little bit on the low side or a little bit on the low motility side where they think they can still get through a gradient, but um, just a little bit thinner for it to get through. Um, simple wash is often used for samples with, with significantly lower motility or significantly lower counts. Um, this is typically just a two mil of sperm wash media and a five or a 10 minute spin. Um, sometimes you'll do two simple washes. Um, the swim up, which is typically an underlay of a uh, concentrated pellet underneath one or two mils of sperm wash media. It can be in the bottom of a organ well dish. It can be in a test tube. It can be in a centrifuge tube. Um, any of those where you're just allowing your modal and nice, clean, happy sperm to swim up to the top. And then you're just gonna pull off that top layer and use that for your ICSI or your IVF procedure. And then also the Zymo, which is, which is a little bit newer on the market and kind of up and coming. I'm starting to hear more and more labs that use this. Um, there's a picture of it here um, where this very center of that slide is where you kind of attach your, your one mil syringe and you're gonna add 800 microliters of your sperm sample that's gonna slide right under that membrane. So the circle that you see on that slide is a very thin membrane with space above it and space below it. The sperm sample straight out of the cup goes directly in there. You don't have to process it at all. This is as simple as simple gets. And then you're gonna put a little bit of sperm wash media on the top of that membrane and your modal sperm are gonna swim through that membrane up to, your, up to that sperm wash um, area. And then you just draw that off after about 30 minutes and you're good to go. So as simple as simple gets, 
for, for a decent quality um, motility and count sperm sample, the zymote is, is super easy. And the sperm you get off the top of that membrane is perfectly clean. So all of your seminal fluid and cells and everything stays underneath that membrane. And what you're getting off that top is, is a nice clean sample. Um, again, the picture down here on the bottom right kind of shows how the density gradient works, going first through a 40% gradient, then through an 80% where your modal and perfectly clean sperm are gonna be pelleted in the bottom, your non-modal and dead sperm and, and other cells are gonna be somewhere in between your 40 and your 80% gradient, and then your seminal plasma is gonna um, maintain up on that top portion. Working on the next slide. All right, um, different prep methods for IVF. So, um, looking at what type of sample you have may, may make you vary on how you're gonna process your sperm. So if I have a donor IUI sample, so your donor sperm samples, when you buy donor sperm are either gonna be ICI ready or IUI ready. The IUI ready samples are already washed. So you don't have to wash them again. I typically put them through a simple wash just to get that cryoprotectin off, but there's no seminal plasma in an IUI ready donor sample. Um, male factor samples where we know the, the motility and the count is severely low, we're going to do just a simple wash and not, not lose any of the sample in a gradient. Uh, the gradient with a simple wash is kind of standard for most labs. So normal sperm samples with normal motility are going to go through a gradient and then a simple wash after that and then be ready for a protocol. Same thing with a donor ICI sample. It is not washed. It needs to go through a gradient and get, get washed because there's still seminal plasma in those. Um, direct plating for TESI samples. Typically, te people prepare TESIs different, and this could be a whole entire hour conversation, but I typically plate directly, just let my, um, my crushed up tissue pull the part testicular tissue settle to the bottom of some wash media, and then I plate it directly from that tube under oil and hunt for my sperm and pull them out for ICSI. Um, and then the zymote would also, could also be used for any normal range sperm sample, but probably for a low motility and low concentration, the zymote isn't gonna be your best option just because it's hard to get an adequate amount of sperm to swim up through that membrane if it's very low. Okay, next slide. All right, so for severe male factor special handling, I know this was something Nabil asked, so I thought I'd quickly try to go through this. Move this over here. Um, so if you don't see any sperm or very few sperm are observed in several fields of view, um, we will typically add two mils of sperm wash media and pipette that vigorously to try to make sure this, the solution is homogenized. Um, we want to make sure that we don't have just a clump of sperm that's not mixing with the rest. So I, I like to add that wash media and pipette it up and down, even vortex it if necessary, to get it mixed really well. Um, and then I'll centrifuge it for about five minutes at 2000 RPMs to concentrate that and then remove that supernatant, resuspend the pellet in about a quarter of a mil, and then reassess for any type of motility or any type of sperm concentration if nothing was observed. Um, if we are in a situation where it is a severe male, male factor case, we will sometimes have them collect several samples so that we can pool them together. Those several samples can be collected over several days. Sometimes in emergency cases, we'll have them collect in the same day, even though it's not ideal. Um, sometimes that has to happen. Um, we also offer the HOS test where we can do, use the hyperosmotic swelling to find the sperm that are alive for that little coiled tail. Um, and then also any type of sperm enhancement media. I know Pentoxy isn't FDA approved, but it is used in a lot of labs and used fairly successfully. But there are other sperm enhancement media out there that are basically a cup of coffee and some caffeine for the sperm that kind of wake them up. So those do help when you have a super low motility or even a Tessie case, those those types of procedures help um, to get a little bit more modal sperm so you know what's alive and what's not. Uh, last slide, I think. All right, so the last slide, I did want to go over a little bit of um, data for you. I can move my face out of the way. Um, 
so I wanted to compare, I know we have some of the um, speakers following me talking about the Zymote and stuff. So I just thought I'd keep it a little bit basic and compare um, some fresh and frozen sperm rates that we had from the last year um, at another clinic. And I just looked at FERT rates and BLAST rates for fresh versus frozen sperm for all patients, not delineating anything between them. Um, and fertilization rate for fresh was about 78% with frozen sperm was about 82%. Blast assist rate being 71% for fresh and 78% for frozen, which was significant. And then I thought I'd take out some of the variables when it comes to egg quality and whatnot. So I'd look at egg donors only, which we had 482 egg donors and the fertilization rate was pretty, um, similar 81 versus 82% between the two, but our blast assist rate was 73% versus 79%. It was just, just significant enough to make me kind of open my eyes a little bit. So thoughts on this, I would love to hear from, from everybody. You know, Do you think what's the deal with frozen sperm? Why are we getting slightly higher fertilization rates and, and significantly higher blast assist rates? So I was, my little question down there is, you know, do you think freezing the sperm is weeding out the poor quality sperm? So if we're freezing a sample, the weak and malformed sperm aren't surviving, they're not gonna make it through the freeze thaw process and not gonna be spun through in our gradient. So only these really strong hardy sperm are, are making it through the freeze process and thereby it's kind of a weeding out process. It's kind of a theory. Don't know, but I thought it was a was a theory to think about, or some other options that any of you guys might have. I would be very interested to hear. Um, and I think that's it for me. That's the end of my five to seven minutes. I hope I didn't go too far over. Um, so back to you, Riley. Thank you so much. Uh, thanks, Divi. Wonderful presentation. Uh, our next speaker is Dr. Aldo Estevizen. Aldo, the floor is yours. Thank you so much. Hey, Dr. Abu. Are we good? Yep. Okay, thank you very much. Yeah, Debbie, thank you for an excellent, excellent talk. Um, you really have covered all the basics. Um, but I would like to discuss the multifactorial um, nature of sperm quality assessment and keeping in mind we are talking about sequential testing. Now, are we, there we go. First of all, let's look at the big five. And this is the big five in Africa, but basic semen analysis also have a big five, which is microscopic evaluation, and then the count, motility, morphology and forward progression. But we do know that these basic semen analysis do not explain IVF results. And therefore, we need to look at um, the dysfunction of the function of the sperm. And here is just a few Oh, it's really slow. And here's just a few of the function tests, sperm function tests. And I put on here the Creamer test, although the Creamer test is an old fashioned test, I still feel the Creamer test is the very beginning of the my, microfluidics um, procedures that we are using now, that we're seeing on the market now. Furthermore, a sperm function test, the hemizona assay, uh, which we can see over here, sperm bound to the zona, acrosomal reaction, the HBA slide test where you use hyaluronin and the sperm um, bind to the hyaluronin, and then also 
we have the hamster oocyte penetration test and very interesting will be the PL, PLC zeta test. But these functional tests cannot explain uh, poor quality embryos, for instance, or uh, miscarriage incidents. And there we have to look and dig deeper and look at DNA. Now, we know that DNA and diversity uh, goes hand in hand. But with quality assessment, we have, let's see, there we go. With quality assessment, we actually have to look at the genetic material and the integrity of the genetic material um, in the sperm, sperm head. And that genetic uh, integrity of the DNA, that should go hand in hand with poor quality uh, embryos, and maybe incidents of miscarriages, as well as the success story of implantation. And I've just listed a few DNA tests, namely immature packaging DNA using trimomycin A3. And I think this is the very basis of these DNA tests. And then of course there's apoptosis using tunnel and an Nexon 5 DNA fragmentation, and we've got a very good example of the halo test over here. And then also fluorescent in situ hybridization which will indicate chromosomal defects. Then we also have what I would like to call the so-called camouflage tests. Now, the camouflage test to me is those tests or sperm quality indicators that's beyond the, beyond the obvious. That's indirect sperm quality assessment. And uh, in, it includes lifestyle, medication, occupation, sport, clinical characteristics, and environmental factors. Now, of course, it does not help to have all these tests and all these values if we don't have cutoff values, as Debbie indicated that the World Health Organization did an excellent job in, in the past decades to have these tests and reference values, these normal um, cutoff values. But I think very important and not to forget is the published material. Um, we must remember that's our peers, that's the researchers, and they are publishing these data. And we see sometimes conflicting cutoff values, normal cutoff values. I think. Uh, we have to give attention to this published data and we have to implement it in our, our laboratories and our decisions. Furthermore, the World Health Organization has also developed certain criteria for rejection of semen samples. Now, in my opinion, rejecting samples, especially in a private clinic, would be a waste of resources and adversely affect the physician and patient contentment or satisfaction. Now, with all this information available and all these results available, we can make an informed decision to which um, technique process, sperm processing technique we're gonna use for a specific sample or patient to then yield the highest quality sperm. Now, like Debbie has said, the discontinuous gradient, I think is just the technique most frequently used in labs. But then again, microfluidics be is becoming more and more popular. And Debbie, um, she, she told us that the Zymod is one of the tests that uh, labs are using more and more. Now we don't need to just use one kind of um, processing procedure when we process sperm. We can use a combination of procedures. We can use microfluidics, for instance, and then follow up with a PIXI procedure, which is physiological ICSI, where the sperm bind to the hyaluronin and pick up those sperm 
and with the next selection procedure, looking at the normal morphological sperm using a very high uh, microscopic magnification. So to conclude, I would say that sperm quality uh, scoring systems are just a guideline. World Health Organization tests and values important, but we should not forget about published tests and their cutoff values. Furthermore, personal experience. If you have a cutoff, a normal cutoff value in your lab that correlates, for instance, with uh, increased euploidy rate, euploid rate, then you should implement that cutoff value in, in your program. And then furthermore, I, it is my opinion that we should estab establish a personalized therapy treatment for an individual, um, such as lifestyle changes, um, alternative medicine like acupuncture, different treatment methodologies, as well as different processing techniques for the sperm. Now, although sperm quality assessment is complex and unpredictable, uh, these assessments and results, I believe, will lead to the improvement of management of male factor infertility. So that was sweet and short. Thank you so much, Aldo. Thank you for this wonderful presentation. And our next speaker is Dr. Anderson. Sharon, the floor is yours. Thank you so much. Okay, so try to go to my first slide. Okay, there we go. Okay, so my name is Sharon Anderson. I'm from the Mainline Fertility Center, which is outside of uh, Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. So I'm also going to touch on the step-by-step -step semen assessment. Um, the first thing that's really important to accurate assessment is the pre-analytical things. So it's very important to give the patient um, clear patient instructions that um, defines the abstinence period, the proper uh, collection cup, and then also transportation to the center. Uh, it really should be transported to the center um, within 30 minutes and at the proper temperature, which is body temperature. And then of course, when the sample, when the technologist is taking the sample from the patient, you wanna make sure that there is a photo ID. Um, if the, if the, um, the partner is dropping off the sample, uh, we require that we do real-time video um, with the male patient that produced the semen sample. Um, then also on the sample ID form, it's important to keep track, to write down the, uh, the time of collection. We also ask the patient to write down if they're on any medications, if he has, a, if he has had a varicocele, um, if he's had any fever, because uh, of course we know that an increase in temperature can have an impact on sperm parameters. Of course, it's a fever um, that he would have had maybe 70 days ago because it takes about 70 days for sperm to be produced. We also have him sign, sign off that it is actually his sample. And then there's, we have um, a section where the, the male patient will circle, you know, what is this sample for? Is it for a semen analysis? Is it for a freeze? You know. Um, he needs to be understanding um, what this sample um, will be used for. Very important is to keep track and to document the chain of custody. And if we, um, we're very strict with witnessing at each and every step um, through that chain of custody. 
So what about rejection criteria? Um, we will definitely reject a sample that's not been collected in the proper sterile specimen container. And I'm sure, you know, a lot of people out there have, um, have received semen samples and all kinds of strange, strange things like plastic bags and, and jars and things. So we'll reject those. Also, if the, um, the male partner, if he can't, if the male patient doesn't have any um, ID, and also if the sample um, was collected more than an hour ago. So the previous speakers touched on all this, but it's you know very simple and straightforward basics. You know, the volume is measured, liquefaction, um, the viscosity of the sample, pH is, is, is checked usually with just, um, you know, pH paper. And then we do the microscopic assessment, we do concentration, percent motility, and also sperm morphology. Um, at mainline fertility, we have um, six satellites and we actually have um, six CASA machines. So we do all of our semen analysis using the Hamilton Thorne Cirrus machines. And again, CASA is, um, it stands for Computerized Assisted Sperm Analyzer. And the power of um, the CASA is that it, it gives us objective measurements of sperm motility parameters. The other very important thing that, um, that we look at is, is uh, sperm morphology. And Debbie did a great job um, explaining that. Okay, what about sperm purification protocols? Um, there are basically, you know, three or four. Um, there's the gradient, uh, the swim up, and I'm going to talk today about the zymote. Um, going over here to the gradient, Thing is that the gradient requires centrifugation, whereas the swim up and the zymote is no centrifugation. And again, there's more and more research about how centrifugation can release free radicals and can damage uh, sperm. What about time? How long does it take to do each one of these procedures? Well, the gradient um, is 30 minutes, but there's multiple centrifugation steps. So, you know, um, it's a, little, it's a little more extra work for the laboratory. You know, usually there's a 20 minute spin and then a five minute and a five minute. So you got to keep your eye on that centrifuge. The swim up is super easy. It's very inexpensive. And, um, you know, it can be as easy as just uh, layering some sperm washing medium on top of a semen, uh, the, the raw semen sample. Okay, Zymo again is, is, is a great new tool. Um, it's very easy. The only downside uh, is that, you know, there is a, uh, you know, a cost for the actual device. So uh, Progenesist asked each one of the speakers to just talk about uh, some research and some numbers. So um, I'm going to talk about an experiment that we recently did. Um, and we have um, submitted the results to ASRM. So we literally just finished this experiment um, maybe a little over a week ago, two weeks ago. So we actually analyzed 25,000 sperm using the CASA machine. And we compared uh, just a simple swim up, no centrifugation to zymote on sperm parameters. Um, you know, both in the zymote and simple swim up, it was a 30 minute incubation. We kept the, the uh, volumes exactly the same. Um, we pulled off a half a mil of sperm and then we looked at all the various sperm motility parameters that I have um, illustrated here in this diagram um, that we were measured objectively from the Hamilton Thorne. And then the data was analyzed using um, uh, a PhD statistician analyzed the data for us.
Um, and these are the results. Um, I know it's a kind of a busy, a busy slide, uh, but um, in a nutshell, we found that the concentration was significantly higher from the zymote. Um, we also had a, a little bit higher um, lateral head movement in the sperm. But overall, the, um, the simple swim up, it gave us um, some uh, higher sperm motility parameters. And um, so again, we just recently just submitted that to, to ASRM. And, and what we concluded from this research was that, you know, this suggests there may be multiple factors that contribute to sperm motility. And, um, and these can be optimized by various sperm preparation techniques. And uh, we also concluded that more research should be performed to figure out these sperm parameters and the relationship with sperm, with sperm quality. And we really um, need to study how these various sperm, um, these sperm uh, parameters impact the fertility outcomes. So again, both sperm uh, separation techniques, they avoided centrifugation. They both are very simple and easy. Um, the, um, and we do know that Zymote has been reported to have less DNA fragmentation, but you know, we're not quite sure the impact of you know, the higher sperm uh, motility you know, just from the simple swim up and, and you know, really what is what is more important? Is it you know DNA fragmentation? Is it motility, or is it some other function tests? So again, just just more research needs to be done. I apologize for the delay. Here we go. Okay, so off from the research, just talk very very quickly about um, special handling of of various uh, types of samples that we get. Just uh, quickly, you know, for mild male factor, like Debbie had mentioned before, we can do uh, great mini gradients to pellet the sperm, remove the debris. Um, if it's, you know, very severe male factor, sometimes there's just, you know, a few hundred sperm. So it's best to just do a simple wash. Testicular sperm is our biggest challenge after the tissue is minced. What you wanna do is plate down the, um, the testicular sperm tissue um, in some sperm washing medium under oil. And then when you do ICSI, you wanna pick up the sperm at that oil to media interface at the, um, at the bottom of the dish. So that's all I have for today. Thank you. Thank you, sir, Sharon, for this uh, great presentation. And uh, let's move to our next speaker is uh, Dr. Kristen Ivani. Kristen, floor, floor is yours. Thank you so much. Thank you, Nabil, and thank you, Riley, for inviting this great panel to talk about this topic um, and your continued commitment to all of us for ongoing learning during extended COVID, um, we can all get all this information from our own living room or lab or wherever we are. So I appreciate that. Um, tough to follow the previous speakers. They covered so much great information. And one nice thing about doing these is everybody does it just a little bit differently. Um, so I'm gonna talk a little bit about what we do at Reproductive Science Center for a basic semen analysis. We're looking at the volume, um, sperm count, motility. We're looking at progression. We look at morphology. We also look for the presence of any round cells, red blood cells, gel pieces that might be in the sample, um, as well as any unusual characteristics of the sample, including viscosity, agglutination, aggregation, color, and debris. And you know, in spite of how some men feel about collecting a semen sample compared to what their female partner is going through, uh, it is a pretty darn simple test that can really alter the entire course of their treatment. So it is really important to get this done early on. 
Um, our basic semen and us assessment, we take uh, 10 microliters out onto a slide for a motility check. We are old fashioned and use a hemocytometer for sperm count. And we do the stint, uh, feathering smear technique for sperm morphology and stain the slides ourselves. Uh, and we also as well measure the volume of the sample. Our basic um, sperm washing method that we use for most samples is a gradient combined with a swim up actually. So um, we take the raw semen sample and lower it, um, I'm sorry, layer it onto an 80% gradient, one layer. And we centrifuge that and um, take out the pellet, which we then wash three times. If it's a really poor quality sample, we're gonna just resuspend it and use it as is. If it's a better quality sample, we'll then allow the sample to, um, the sperm to swim up. I think it's really important to remember what both Debbie and Aldo said about, um, you know, tailoring your method to the particular sample that you have. It's not a one size fits all. So I think to really look carefully at each sample and the previous speakers did go through the different ways you can treat individual samples. Um, rejection criteria, Sharon touched on this a little bit. Um, yeah, we've seen shot glasses, bags, fish bowls, candy glass, candy jars, baby food jars. Um, we don't reject samples that are for a semen analysis because we will counsel the patient and let them know um, that they may have to repeat it. We would reject it if it were for an IUI or an IVF uh, communication ahead of time, and Sharon talked about, you know, did a really nice presentation about the pre-analytic steps that should be taken. And I think communicating with and educating the patient beforehand on why this is important and what we need them to do avoids these sometimes awkward situations, especially when they want the candy jar back. Um, we process male factor TESI samples you know, I put on here, choose your weapon uh, on the far left hand side are two just syringes with needles. The next one over is uh, bent needles that some people like to use. You can fire polish a pipette and make sort of a mortar and pestle kind of thing. The next one's my very favorite, two microscope slides. Changed my life when I saw somebody do that. The surface area that you can dissect is so much better and so much cleaner and faster than using two needles. And then finally, uh, little scissors. On the right-hand side is a tissue dissociator, which we have, but I'm not a huge fan of because it makes like testicular jello. Um, but in some cases, I think it does dissociate the tissue uh, that helps you a little bit better get the, um, the sperm out of there. And we will usually do a, a twice wash on these given the, the motility and progression is usually pretty poor. And as the previous speaker said, um, plate this out and then use it for ICSI. Some special cases, uh, when you have a retrograde ejaculation, you may use a Sudafed treatment um, or Alka-Seltzer to alkalinize the bladder. Azospermic samples, we're gonna centrifuge to concentrate those as was previously described. Uh, we'll also do a qualitative fructose if the patient is known to not be a vasectomy patient. Um, live dead stain for viability is also a trick we can use. And there's some, a lot of data coming out using calcium ionophore to treat um, global spermia patients, but even patients with poor um, fertilization, poor blast development. So those are all things um, coming out more in the literature as well. We have some experience with Pixie. I think Sharon talked about this, as did Aldo a little bit. It's a special dish with some high aluronin dots on there. You load your wash sperm sample on there and you're gonna select the sperm that are bound to the drop or to the little high aluronin spot that those have um, better maturity, potentially better DNA integrity and membrane um, binding ability. And then you pick those sperm up and use them for ICSI. Um, this is a paper that was um, authored by Katie Warlow, and it was a, a multi-center randomized controlled study. Um, this paper came out um, in 2013, and it was a PIXI trial looking at um, 
you know, fertilization and embryo development and such. And one of the unusual things that came out of this paper, that I don't think anybody really expected, was that, um, you know, we didn't really see better fertilization rates, but there was a lower miscarriage rate. And this was subsequently shown again by um, another multi-center trial in um, England, in the UK. Uh, although they did not see any difference also in pregnancy rate, premature birth rate, live birth rate, but did see a decrease in the miscarriage rate. In our center, for, for our physicians, we really only use this for patients who have had um, recurrent pregnancy loss. Um, one of the things that I think is super important we need to keep in mind that we do need to maintain quality management when we're doing a semen analysis. It seems like a really simple test, but <clears throat> we do need to control so we know exactly what we're doing. Number one thing that I didn't put on here is training. We need to make sure people are trained and competency evaluated. Use AccuBeads to um, ensure that your sperm count is accurate, that you're getting agreement between your replicant counts some sort of motility verification, proficiency testing, um, which you know, for most of us who use one of those standard proficiency testing, you're looking at sperm count, morphology, maybe viability. Um, check your stains for contamination and make sure that they actually are staining what they're supposed to be staining. Um, and finally, calibration of the equipment. Make sure that your incubator's at the right temperature, that your pipetters are measuring what they're supposed to that your counting chambers aren't scratched or dinged up, um, haven't been damaged. If you're using a micrometer to measure your sperm, that those are actually accurate and calibrated. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, our next speaker is uh, Dr. Tony Anderson. Thank you. Thank you, Nabil. Um, delighted to be here. And uh, um, everybody gave some great uh, presentations today. And um, in the discussion, I, uh, it's a great segue as uh, Kristen got into the quality management. I'm going to start off into that and get into some of our Zymo data. So, um, One of the things I, uh, when I first start training people, I always want to uh, describe some of the accuracy and precision of some, our, some of our results. And, uh, you know, when you're accurate, accurate and precise, you are hitting the target and you're hitting the, the, the spot perfectly. When you're not accurate, but you're precise, then you're, you're on the target, but you're, you're hitting a ways from the bullseye. When you're neither accurate or precise, then you're you're all over the target, maybe not even um, getting close to where you need to be. I use the example of you could use a counting chamber. It doesn't matter if you have the the, the eyepiece in your ocular or using a uh, you know a macular chamber or a hematometer. If you only count one square, um, you get a count of one, and you could multiply that times ten, and the sense of uh, there's 10 squares in a line, you would get a count of 10. Um, when I'll talk to people, you can count a whole line and you'll get a count of 17, or you could count all 100 squares and take the average of the 100 uh, and the 10, 10 lines and get an average of, of 21. And so you could see anywhere between the, between the 10 and the 21, but the, the 17, the more, the more squares you count, the more accurate, precise you're getting. So. The more you count, the better you're going to get. Um, one of the things I noticed when I, uh, well, when I've been inspected by um, inspectors, um, is particularly CLIA, not so much CAP. I will get a um, when you're doing your QCs and your QC beads, you're supposed to count them twice, and um, when you when you count count the beads. There should be less than a 10% range between the two uh, counts. So, for some reason, my slide's not going forward. There it is. So, here's an example of uh, like your daily quality control beads, um, things you should do every time you're doing a diagnostic semen analysis. 
And if you look at these beads, they're, they're basically telling you the range of what they would be a 35 plus or minus fives. So you could count them, you know, count one could be anywhere between 30 and, and 40. And most people will say that you're within range. But using this example in that, uh, in that calculator we have on, the, on that previous slide where you take the, uh, the difference between the two divided by the average of the two and um, times 100 and you'll get the, uh, the percent difference. Here you get a 13% error between the two first count, the two counts and technically makes you non-compliant for your uh, quality, quality control. Um, and so this is you know, something making sure that you're, you know, when you're doing this, it's gonna make sure that you're both accurate and precise in your, uh, in your readings that you're doing. So, you know, and also getting to some, some of the proficiency testing. So as uh, Kristen mentioned, we, um, you know, you have your internal QCDs, but you also need to have, uh, work with an external audit system. And, you know, technically because semen, ana sperm, semen analysis is an unregulated assay, nobody's actually died from uh, 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 incorrect semen analysis. It's, it's an unregulated assay. And you're permitted to create your own internal assays. I've done this in some of my small uh, satellite programs where we probably don't even make two thousand dollars a year, um, which you know, which what our uh, PT might cost us. And so, you know, you have to do two events per year. And technically, if you miss one, you have to get both of them correct. And so, uh, otherwise, you have to you uh, um, need to get another sample because. When CLIA or CAP or Joint Commission comes in, if you fail one, you technically have to pass both each year and passing within 80% or better. So there's only one way to pass is actually to pass both. Uh, if you fail one, then um, you're only at 50% for the, for, uh, for the each, each uh, survey. And if you do have a lack of consensus, what do you do with that? So um, you have to, and I'll use morphology as an example. Um, I like to look, I went through the past three uh, uh, ABB, uh, AAB uh, proficiency testing and the, and the range that is reported anywhere between zero and 19. Uh, we reported say 13, but the mean for that sample was 7.4. You can see in all, all the samples, all, you know, the one and two from one, each, each uh, survey, uh, all of them started at zero and went as high as 20% uh, percent normal forms um, and the average is anywhere between five and eight. And so I always kind of joke about it a little bit. I could probably take a slide and put it to my head and guess and without ever staining it and probably would be within range. And so how accurate is this uh, quality management system that this external audit system we're using? So I've actually added an additional audit system where uh, whether you're using video or using, um, you know, the, just a regular sample from the lab, have everybody from the lab uh, make sure that we, you know, intertech variation, they'll read the morphologies, the counts and the uh, um, motilities. And we'll look for a, a, a standard deviation between all the technicians, anybody who's outside of that, and uh, not, you know, that's, it's a way of evaluating our competency. So um, I've added that to our quality management plan in the laboratory. Um, we had uh, some talks about DNA fragmentation. Um, you know, I, uh, Don Evenson was an early pioneer to the uh, DNA fragmentation world. And I, and I remember when we had samples we'd send out to uh, for DNA fragmentation tests, you know, the early, early literature said that if there was any DNA, you know, above a certain level, there were no pregnancies. And, um, you know, one of my early experiences with this, we did, uh, we did some samples where the DNA fragmentation was high. We also um, did some of the um, hyaluronins. Uh, I was very excited for that. Did a, an earlier um, uh, group study with some of the folks and looked at my data separately from that. And when we found that, you know, people who did had DNA fragmentation and 
Uh, they did try to conceive naturally on their own through IUI um, and even conventional insemination. We didn't have any pregnancies. Uh, when they had high DNA fragmentation did, and we did ICSI, suddenly we started getting pregnancies comparable to what our other uh, cases were doing. Not that we were doing any special selection for it through hyaluronin or anything. But I just thought that was interesting. And that's one of the reasons we don't, it's not one of the reasons why I do ICSI on everybody, but I had a little bit of comfort knowing that if they had DNA fragmentation here, you know, 20 years ago, that um, I knew with DNA fragmentation with ICSI from our small study, we were making pregnancies. So I always talk, I like to talk about this, the, the tale of two uh, prep methods. Uh, um, I, I was glad to see some people talk about um, swim ups. I haven't done a, a swim up since I first got into human IVF almost 30 years ago, over 30 years ago. Um, but I do think it might make a comeback, particularly with, uh, you know, comparing as um, Sharon said, with the uh, Zymode and just regular swim up. But we used to order Percol straight out of Sigma and, uh, you know, dilute it to our, you know, 90 or 80 um, in our 40% and layer those and process them. But um, when the Zymo device came out, I was, uh, I was um, uh, not ready to, to, to do it, but I did a couple samples with it. And I, and we, um, you know, I said, I'm gonna try it for a month and see how it goes. And I submitted some data to uh, ASRM in 2020 that showed the difference in, in euploidy for um, between day five and day six. And I had a significantly higher rates of, of euploidy with the Zymo device. Um, surprisingly, I didn't know what it meant by that. I actually uh, uh, had some questions at ASRM last year um, to, uh, to break it down into age groups. So I. I presented this uh, data elsewhere, looking at less than 35, greater than 35. And ironically, this data here was the, the euploidy was higher than greater than 35. But I looked at the current data um, again, and I have uh, much more data to add to that. Um, let me go to the next slide here. And have over a thousand um, embryos biopsied in day five and actually there's no significance between the gradient and the Zymo device. Um, and uh, looking at the pregnancy outcomes, um, really no significant improvements with the uh, ongoing or you know, miscarriage rates from, from both devices. And uh, this is for the less than 35. And the next slide, we'll look at the, uh, the greater than 35. And very similar, we actually, I, you know, and I, this could just be you know, subject to the data set, but you know, did actually show significantly um, uh, more euploid embryos in the gradient this time. You know, looking at the larger data set, uh, you know, all, going back all the way to 2016. And I wanted to make sure I was looking, of course, this is retrospective, so it's not a controlled randomized trial, but um, went back to, you know, wanted to make sure I was using the same technologies with the de next gen sequencing when we uh, first started doing PGT. Um, that with that technology and still using it today. But you can see the miscarriage rates really aren't any different and that regardless of what the euploidy rates are. Um, we, you know, I did notice here is that I did get, I am getting more day fives than I, um, than I was with the gradient. Um, and I think that could be very subjective to the sense of, I know my day fives have higher implantation rates so I'm more aggressive about, you know, if someone's not ready in the morning, I will wait till the afternoon to, uh, to biopsy my day fives. So I just wanted to kind of show what that looks like. I, I think, um, uh, I can't remember, Sharon might've showed some, uh, um, some, some, some halo sperm. And this is from one of our samples, uh, pre, uh, pre Zymote, you can see some, some samples that did not get the halo, which is uh, the indicator that there's that there is DNA fragmentation. And of the ten samples I analyzed, um, you know, on average we had about 19% um, um, uh, DNA fragmentation in the initial sample. And then when post post prep, virtually no, I didn't, I couldn't find an, a DNA fragmented sperm. So. 
Um, I was very skeptical at first, um, and you know, even showing that the data is not giving me more uh, euploids or anything like that. Um, I believe, uh, you know, I believe that the in the in the lean management uh, process of the laboratory, I feel like I'm I'm actually being safer and saving time with uh, the, using the Zymo device. So. I figure it actually pays for itself in the sense, even though it is a little bit more expensive to, to utilize. And so when I, you know, the question is, you know, quality versus quantity, um, you know, when it comes to IVF, I always tell people when I'm training them, um, we want quality. I only need one good sperm per egg. And so I'm always going to shoot for getting the best sperm I can when I can. Um, I'm, I haven't done, we, the only people we've done gradient samples on in the last uh, probably two years is, um, you know, the really severe male factors and our testy cases, we don't use IMOD on, of course, but uh, we'll even use it on donor sperm. And um, I think uh, I was interested to hear uh, Debbie's comments on the frozen sperm because the, we, I've done a lot of DNA frag on the fresh sperm versus frozen. and. 100% of the time, the DNA fragmentation does go up. So um, I think those are really interesting uh, statistics and the data from that. And, you know, I, I am one of my question going back to uh, maybe the audience and Debbie is, could it be because we're doing ICSI that we're circumventing some of the problems with DNA fragmentation? So I'll stop there and I believe we're gonna open it up to questions. Thank you so much. Thanks, Tony, for this great presentation. And uh, now we're gonna uh, start the uh, roundtable discussion. I was really interested um, in the last comment that you made, Tony, about the uh, the study that looked at the uh, uh, implant uh, euplid rate comparing, um, you know, different. Um, uh, filtration system or purification system, zymotes and other, and uh, and uh, you noted uh, in, uh, improvement or increase in euploid rates. But then when you look at the age group components, patients under thirty five years old don't really benefit. Um, and that reminds me a little bit of the STAR study when they looked at PGTA. Uh, why do you think that is the case? Well, I mean, I, when I first looked at the data, I did see more euploid, and it doesn't make sense. Oh, do I unmute? Oh, I'm not unmute. Am I unmute? I'm not unmute. Um, the original data did not have, uh, I mean, it was a small data set, and um, I saw the euploid difference, and it did make sense. and. Um, uh, that, that that would be because most of our aneuploidy comes from our oocytes in that first meiotic reduction. You know, at least that's what we're taught. And, and so we were basically, contra I was contradicting what biology would say and was, was interested to see if going forward. So um, the data doesn't show that now. Uh, and so, you know, it doesn't mean I'm, I'm going to stop using Zymote, but um, gonna, I'm going to keep progressing and actually keep looking at my data. And I would actually like to maybe start incorporating a swim up and possibly looking at the DNA frag in that. Um, unfortunately, I, I actually uh, have CASA systems, the Cero systems in my lab too. And I can, um, you know, I, so I'm, I'm taking the human bias out and doing the DNA frags with that. It's just, the kits are very expensive. So I'm trying to be yes. selective. So just to clarify, patients over 35 do benefit from using Zymote or other, other methods? Data doesn't support that anymore. Before it did, but it doesn't support that anymore, no. And how about, so that's in, in terms of, uh, I guess, uh, uh, implantation rates and pregnancy and, and how about miscarriage rates? Because I think that was one of the comments that uh, Kristen uh, made earlier. Kristen, what do you think? Do, you see, do you agree with uh, with Tony and the, on the comments? And what about the miscarriage? You're on mute, Kristen. 
Thanks. Um, I was talking about Pixie, you know, using Pixie and seeing lower miscarriage rates. We really don't have experience with the Zymote. I would like to see more data. Um, I, I think there's no disagreement that we have um, less DNA fragmentation coming out of that, but I would really like to see live birth outcomes um, from that before we start advocating it for all patients. Is it really, is it really helping? Mm -hmm. Very good, thank you so much. Uh, Sharon, what, what's your take on, on, on this? On, on Zymote and um, if it improves euploidy rates or? Yeah, euploidy, okay. pregnancy yeah. rates. Um, you know, that, that is the question, you know, just it has been reported to um, re reduce DNA fragmentation, but, you know, how does that really factor in the outcomes? You know, is, is it DNA fragmentation? Is it motility? You know, how, how do we separate sperm uh, to optimize our outcomes? So I, I think there just needs to be more research. And, and like Tony said, it's, you know, our sperm separation, and then how does that translate into live birth rates? Very good. I'm going to come back to you for another question uh, on the CASA system software, because I'm really interested in that, uh, you know, uh, method. But uh, uh, can we take an opinion from Debbie and from Aldo about this topic, or should I ask another question? What you guys would? About... Hey, the Zymo or about the CASA? In general, do you if you use any any method for, uh, you know, processing, uh, you know? Process I'm a firm believer in take things case by case. You know, you, you can't have a one size fits all in anything that we do. Not even sperm processing, but everything we do in the lab, you have to look at it and think you can't just be a robot and say, this is how we do everything. We do everything the same. It's not that way. Um, so I think that holds true for sperm too. You know, you, you take an initial look and you look at your count, your motility and your volume and like, okay, is this gonna be a simple basic processing technique or do we need to handle this special? And I think that's what makes a good lab, a good lab is that you do cater your technique to what that patient needs in particular. And it's not a one size fits all. So I don't really think one is better than the other. I think the Zymote is promising and exciting for eff efficiency in the lab because it is very easy to use and it doesn't take a lot of time. So if it processes just as efficiently as a centrifugation or a swim up, it's, it's, and you need some efficiency and some time in your lab, I think that's very promising. But do you wanna use the Zymote on something that has a low motility or a low count? No, cause you're, you're not gonna get a good yield from that. And then it's gonna slow down your ICSI procedure because you don't have enough sperm and then it's gonna back up. So you you have to be able to analyze every situation individually. Yeah, thank you so much. And I was going to ask you about low count, low sperm count. Uh, I know that you propose an alternative uh, way of uh, processing the, the sperm. And then maybe we can raise that question to the panel. Uh, after I take the, uh, you know, the opinion of Aldo on this, and then we can maybe mm -hmm. move to the next question. Aldo? Thank you. Yes, um, we are using Zymot, and um, of course, it's we don't have a formal kind of, of study going, but I would like to um, recommend Zymot in the sense that we've seen, we've been using it in patients that previously did not have any blastocysts. And when using the Zymot, at least these patients do have blastocysts. But I must also agree with Tony that we have, haven't seen increased euploid embryos using the Zymot. But turning to the, to the speakers and to the panel, it's worrying to me to think, um, in all these years, it was propagated that uh, centrifugation 
is not good for the sperm because of the damaging to the sperm membrane. And of course, the increased ROS species, which is affecting our DNA, the sperm DNA integrity. So mm -hmm. to me, it is really surprising that we want to go back to a centrifuge more uh, and, and the swim up, which was basically the very start in processing sperm. So, and I do agree with Debbie that um, you have to look at a patient and take it case by case, you know. Um, it doesn't help you think Zymos is such a, uh, really such a uh, popular and good uh, technique when there is a patient with low motility and a low uh, concentration of sperm. And we've seen, usually if I see something like that, I split the sample so that I have a backup which I can just then wash or then use a mini, mini gradient. Thank you so much. And you mentioned earlier the use of certain uh, DNA-based tests to assess sperm, and that's the tunnel test, the uh, uh, you know, CMA, and, and all the other, other tests that, that looks at the fragmentation of the sperm. Is this common in your laboratory to use? To you know, um, I have to go back and say that in South Africa, where I'm coming from, that is really sequential testing in a big lab is common. You'll start with the very basics, working towards function tests, functional tests, and then the DNA testing, which is chromomycin A3, um, which were used as a routine test in South Africa and gave us really good answers to poor quality embryos. Here in the States, of course, it's different. And we're at a very a much smaller clinic. And unfortunately, it's not part of our um, testing program. Very good. How about the rest of the panel? Do you guys use any DNA-based test, uh, fragmentation, or, or any other test? I'll start with you, uh, Tony. Uh, no, we don't. Uh, on a regular basis in our lab for any diagnostic testing even. And uh, it's just I actually, um, in my training lab, I do some research for an outside group where I'm able to do some, some of the DNA frag tests. So I can take samples from my IVF lab and look at them afterward. But uh, um, so not it's not part of our regular diagnostic workup, but... Um, if you have the ability, it's not a bad idea. Thank you so much. How about the rest of the panel? So we, we don't do any DNA testing in our laboratory, but we have had an increase in requests um, from patients um, and therefore the physicians to do the DNA fragmentation, but, but we send them out. We send them out to, uh, to a lab. And do you use, uh, do you see any benefits of doing uh, those kind of tests? Well, especially for the patients um, who are doing the IUIs and they're not getting pregnant, you know, then the physicians will order DNA fragmentation tests. So, you know, the question is, what do you do with that sperm? Um, if that patient has high DNA fragmentation I've read that you can shorten the abstinence period and reduce DNA fragmentation, and then you can also do ICSI. So maybe it's a nice way to, um, to counsel patients that they have to move from, from the IUI into IVF and ICSI to achieve uh, a pregnancy. Yeah, thank you so much. Debbie, I think you, were, you wanted to make a comment earlier. I think you muted. Uh, you are muted. <laughs> Sorry, my dog was making noise, so I muted myself. Um, we did occasionally on a case-by-case -case basis order um, DNA fragmentation index for patients that we're just looking for answers for. So patients where we got a low fertilization or their embryo development was unexpectedly poor. And, you know, we're looking for answers for the patient. We would order that and 
sometimes it was very kind of comforting for the patient to have an answer like, oh, our DNA fragmentation index is, is horrible. So it gives an answer and it, it kind of for the patient's sake gives them something they can work on because the husband always feels like I can improve my sperm. I'm going to eat better and I'm going to take my vitamins and my sperm's going to become perfect. So it kind of gives the patient some peace of mind and it makes them feel like there's something they can do to try to make it better. Um, so we would on occasion order it for just when we just didn't have answers for a patient. Yeah, thank can you I, so much. Can I jump in here and just um, did touch on lifestyle, but I'm a firm believer and I've seen it so many times. If you address the patient's lifestyle, it makes all the difference in the quality of sperm. So I think that is really an area that we have to give attention to. Lifestyle and um, alternative medicines, something like uh, acupuncture. There's more and more data proving that it is beneficial using, using acupuncture, not only on the male, but also the female, of course. So mm -hmm. those new sort of um, sperm quality assessment, indirect quality assessments, I think become more and more important to us. Great point. Yeah. Um, no, that's that's totally true. And uh, back to the point of euploidy, I know that's Tony, you mentioned the euploidy issue. Uh, when we analyze, uh, you know, same sex um, couple um, that are both sperm uh, providers and then we have the same source of egg usually is an a, a a donor egg uh, we see differences with ages we see that older you know partners tends to have more endoploidy than younger partners and that's the best control you have two individuals and the same donor um so we do see differences i don't know how that you know, uh, compute when it comes to, you know, zymos and all, all the other things, but but the reality is there is a difference in all, in age when it comes to age. Um, and I'm gonna go back to you, uh, Sharon, about the the Casa software, and yeah. that's for me pretty interesting. You know, how do you screen or how do you analyze sperms? Um, you mentioned a study with twenty five thousand sperm. Um, and looking at motility and other progressive motility, et cetera. Mm -hmm. What is, how do you see the, if you can give us a little bit more information, how do you use this on a daily basis? What is your, and what benefit does it provide you that type of screening? And uh, what what do you see the use like in a, in a clinical mm -hmm. settings? What, what the benefits would be? <laughs> Um, yeah, we, like I said before, we have seven CASA machines, we have uh, six satellites. And, um, you know, the biggest benefit is that it saves us time. Um, in, in a very, very busy practice, this saves us a lot of time. We put this sample um, on the slide, put it in, into the CASA machine, and with a few, within a few seconds, you know, you have your answers. And of course, you can tie that into your EMR. So the semen analyses, um, you know, go right into right into your EMR for the physicians. Um, and at all the satellites, um, of course, we don't do IVF at those satellites, but we do do a lot of IUIs. So again, um, it saves us a tremendous amount of time. I personally like it because I, I feel it gives um, you know, an objective assessment of sperm motility. And then it also breaks it down into not just percent motility, but but all the other different facets, uh, facets of motility. Because in, in fact, you know, there are quite a few subpopulations um, of sperm uh, within, within a, a semen sample. So um, it's very interesting how different treatments, different separation uh, techniques, um, how the temperature, um, how they affect these various sperm motility parameters. Uh, thank you so much. So when, when, if we look at the future of, uh, you know, uh, andrology and how those 
the technology play in the selection of sperm? Is there any window for an automation on selecting the best sperm possible? Is that is that something that is within the scope of science to be able to select the best sperm or a good looking sperm, not by eye, by using certain features that are automated, Kristen? Well, I think what we're seeing now are a lot of precursors to that. I think all these devices that we're talking about, um, that's their goal. But I think what we all as end users need to see is what's the real impact? You know, do I need to spend the money on a CASA machine or pass along this cost for a pixie plate or a, or a Zymo slide to a patient um, without really knowing that we're doing a good job? I don't doubt at all that these methods select nice sperm, but I need to see real hard data that it's really going to impact the patient outcome, which is, are they taking home a baby from the cycle? Yeah, absolutely. Tony? <clears throat> Um, yeah, I agree. I always joke about and say, you know, sperm's the forgotten gamete and, you know, none of us spend enough time really researching it and which is kind of, you know, when, when, um, when the hyaluronin slides came out, I was very excited about that and was, you know, part of the multi-center trial for FDA and super excited about being able to get the best sperm and, um, you know, but it didn't like 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 Kristen said, the data didn't show it to me. So um, only I only do Pixie when someone requests it. Uh, Zymo, very excited about that, and you know the initial data was was exciting. You know, we'll see where it goes, but you know, we you know the idea is that we just keep pushing forward, and maybe one day we will be able to do that. Um, without looking at our data, we'll never know if something's working or not, and so. Um, and that's what I'm trying to do, even though it's retrospective, not blinded randomized control trials, but just looking at the data and what's it clinically showing. Thank you so much. I think that ICSI kind of set back the field of the study of male reproduction and spermatogenesis and andrology, because all of a sudden we have this tool that we can overcome all of these things that we used to think more about and spend more time researching. And I, I kind of feel like in a way we're getting back to that now, really looking at the individual sperm, you know, or the forgotten gamete, as Tony said. But I do think that ICSI kind of put all that on hold because we were so excited that we had this tool now to use that we weren't so concerned with the why because we had a tool to fix it. Uh, sure. You know, I think it would be very interesting if we could um, do some sort of artificial intelligence on the sperm and maybe motility parameters and maybe some other things that we can measure on those individual sperm that we use for a particular ICSI and then track those embryos to see you know, um, you know what resulted in, in the better outcomes, what resulted in the competence uh, of those of those embryos, and then work backwards, and and so we can learn. You know what really is important. Is it is it fragmentation? Is it binding? Is it um, motility? Is it lateral head movement? B cross frequency. So I think artificial intelligence is the future. Yeah, that's what I was alluding to when I when I talked to you about the cusp of because the CASA can do that scan. So the question is, can you do it on an individual sperm? Um, obviously there are challenges there. You cannot do DNA fragmentation because you have to sacrifice that sperm to be able to look at the DNA. Uh, but I do see that with the, with the technology, you may be able to streamline the process of selection prior to ICSI, where ICSI would be the next step Yes. Um, yeah. Devi, what's uh, your take home message or, or your, how, what would you recommend the embryologists that are starting their career uh, on how to handle sperm? What would be the three or four top priorities? I would say to keep an open mind and to know that there's more than one way to do things right. Um, and you know, I would, I would say 
you know, make sure you look at each individual case and, and think, don't just be a robot and follow a protocol. You are supposed to follow a protocol, but protocols in some areas can be vague and you can have variations in your protocol that are written where in these particular cases, you need to make adjustments and you have to be able to ebb and flow with, with the way things are going, just like everything you do in the lab. You know, when you're performing an ICSI, every egg doesn't act the same. You have to be able to respond and adjust your procedure so that that egg doesn't die and the egg is still going to fertilize and that embryo is going to develop. And same thing with your biopsy. It doesn't all respond the same and the sperm doesn't respond the same either. So, you know, if you get a sample that looks good and you run it through a gradient and you have zero pellet at the bottom, you have to make adjustments and you have to make some changes and and be able to to go with the flow thank you so much aldo well i think to me sequential testing is an answer to a lot of to a lot of our problems we will understand the sperm better and we will understand the outcome of our ivf or six um, exe cycles um, and be able to explain what has happened uh, in a better way if we do sequential testing. Well, I agree, you know, uh, we should take it case by case. And again, I want to emphasize, you know, that some things work in your lab. It might not work in your neighbor's lab. And for instance, HBA, um, Hyaluron and binding uh, gave us very good results. Um, but again, you know, it. I think it's what works for you. Thank you so much, Tony. Um, I think that, um, you know, like, as Aldo said, you know, um, everything's gonna, you know, you gotta, it, what might work for me might not work for everybody else. Uh, works for me or doesn't, might not work for everybody else, but you know, every sample is different. And I don't, you know, use Zymote on everybody because some people just don't have good enough sperm. And um, so you, you do, you have to go with the ebb and flow of, uh, of the lab. And, and really that's where experience takes time. You know, the training, you can, you can teach anybody how to do a sperm prep in, in a couple of hours, but, you know, it takes years of training to kind of know how to adjust to those things. And so, you know, when we go through training here, you know, I can send someone out and they, they'll know how to do things, but you're still going to have to experience, you know, the, the troubles and, and, you know, the challenges that we have in the lab. So, you know, it's just, you know, I, I would say like every time we have something like this, um, don't be afraid of it, try it and see how it works for you and, you know, and then go and then make, make adjustments from there. Do embryologists or andrologists need more training or need training on this particular aspect of uh, processing sperm? Well, one of the things that, you know, the easy thing to do is teach everybody how to do a gradient because that's what most laboratories do. But it, you know, like for like people like Debbie and I who are involved with the training and, and teaching the up and coming embryologists, it, you know, go back to some of the old school things and teach them how to do a swim up uh, in the event your centrifuge doesn't work um, or in the event, uh, you know, you don't, you know, you know, what do you do if they've never done something like that, then they'll never know. And so that was the first sperm prep I ever did. There was, you know, we didn't know what per call was back in the day. And, um, you know, I would say the, the ICSI is, as Kristen said, changed our world. Um, but at, since ICSI was designed, like we don't hardly use any met donor sperm in our IVF lab, except for, you know, special cases. Thank you so much. Kristen? You're oh. on mute. Uh, one of the points that Aldo brought up, I thought was super important that every clinic should be doing it is focusing on lifestyle. Um, and it should be happening at the very beginning, you know, right at the new patient visit. And the more education that we can provide for the patient along that line, I think 
the better off they'll do they'll be plus they feel like they're doing something um i also feel like we shouldn't necessarily get caught up in a rut of we always do this and and i think one of the main aspects of training people in a successful lab and you know tony and debbie touched on a little bit is like be aware of everything that's going on around you you know does the the media change color, the incubator smell. I mean, to really be aware of, of all the things that are going on around you and kind of go back to basics, you know, take the WHO manual or some other manual like that and spend the time going through it and really training people what it is that's going on, not just how to do something, but why it's important to do it like this, why quality management is important. Um, what if you don't get the outcome you thought you were going to get? What if you get a sample that you weren't? Um, all those things, I think, are really an important part of parts of training. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, Sharon? Um, what is the question? Uh, what do you take away message or what your recommendation to embryologists who are starting their career? What, the, what are the top three or four priorities when it comes to uh, uh, dealing with sperm? Oh, um, yeah, I think it starts, it, it starts with really, re really reading that who manual. It's sort of the, the Bible of, um, you know, the andrology laboratory, um, you know, just a lot of experience working with different types of samples and how, how to handle different situations. You know, one note is like, for example, the zymote, um, the kind of cool thing about that is that if you do put the sperm sample through that zymote and you don't get enough sperm for for ICSI, um, you can always use some of the extra sample and and um, do a simple wash and, and pellet that sperm and and, and use it for ICSI. So again, it's not teaching just you know the routine uh, analysis that we do um, in the laboratory, but also learning how to deal with those difficult situations. Thank you so much. Uh, well, we are coming to the end of the webinar today. And let me look at the questions we have asked the audience. Did you find the webinar to be useful? 83% said yes. Would you like to see a webinar like this in the future? 94% said yes. Thank you so much for all the inputs. It has been really an exciting discussion on sperm. Um, Next week, we are going to have another webinar, this time on preparing for IVF treatments. So I would like to reiterate my gratitude and appreciation for each one of you for your contribution. And I will see you next week. Thank you so much. Thanks, Nabil. Thanks, Thank Nabil. you. Bye. Thank you very much. Bye. Bye. Bye, everybody.